This new work is being shown here for the first time, other maybe than one that escaped from his studio, and it's great to see. So, Arthur Cohen. You've made a series of bodies of work that, that range from, to cite a few, uh, perspectival paintings of Borromini interiors, linear abstract paintings, shaped abstract paintings, paintings of bulls, and also work that you could call eccentric, like paintings of phrases like schmaltz kills, self-portraits in costume, dressed as a doctor, in custom-made shiny spandex superhero costumes. Um, and now this wonderful body of new abstract painting. And when you asked me to, to write about it for a catalog, I thought about these paintings in the context of your previous work. And I think you do too. I know you do. And when I started writing the catalog essay, you steered me to something that you had written recently. I've gone back and forth between what I would describe as serious and what I would call absurd with no sense of hierarchy. It's like a pendulum swinging back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, funny serious, funny serious. So Arthur, would you say more about those contrasting and simultaneous elements? Sure. Uh, I, don't see I don't see the value of one over the value of, of another. So, I mean, sometimes I'm lost in a kind of reverie of great painting that, you know, we all know about that. And sometimes I think about, I aim lower and I think about my life. And, uh, and that yields some very strange things, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, terror at the beginning of having kids and, you know, how, how am I going to support this or, you know, and then, you know, in the Jewish, in the Jewish culture, not the religion, in Jewish culture, all, the, all the, the mothers of daughters want their daughters to marry doctors. So I said, I'll never be a doctor, but I can sure make myself one in a painting. So, so you know, I started painting myself with lots of kitty stethoscopes, grown up, you know, real doctor stethoscopes. I was spending a fortune on stethoscopes. And uh, I, I was trying to, uh, you know, get involved with my kids. You know, they would be in these paintings. We'd play with the stethoscopes, play baseball with the stethoscopes swing a bat and hit a big ball of rolled up stethoscopes. Uh, you know, uh, just and anything I could think of, you know, and, uh, you know, to sort of get them aboard and think he's crazy, but he's OK. <laughs> well, you also you also in, in your writing, you, you specifically said funny serious. And at one point you told me that one of the reasons that Gorky is maybe your foremost influence or, or mentor as an artist was that he showed you that great art could be funny as well as great. Other people showed me that too, but humor to me is a part of life. It's how you make it through and get some perspective on it. Then I all of a sudden become serious again. I just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth and the, you know, the, the range of subjects that I paint is tremendous. The way I paint them is very different for those two back there are painted completely with my hands. So Arthur, let me ask you, talking about putting your life in the paintings, I mean, recently you said when we were talking, in my painting, I always allow my life experience to take a seat at the table where it belongs, which I, I loved how you put that and I wrote it down. But so you, you've just explained, described how you made paintings with, figurative paintings with personal narrative that very clearly, if a, bit, if a bit wildly, related to your life. But someone could come into this show and see these as, if such a thing exists, pure abstract painting. Um, so can you talk about how these paintings um, bring your life into the work? These paintings, first of all, what preceded these paintings were about six years of painting rodeo bulls, you know, just 
considerably larger than these paintings. And so some of the dynamics of these, you know, filtered into this, although not the subject matter. And, uh, but some of that, the dynamics already existed from other series of paintings I made. You, I, talk, you talked about how the surfaces of these paintings. Yeah, the surfaces kind of, of the paintings make references to my life and perhaps other people's lives. You know, for example, you know, so this is very dry and nasty. <laughs> and this is very dry and nasty. This one, actually a tube, you know, when I was trying to take a top off, it's 40 year old paint, but it exploded into my face. And uh, I finished the shape and the next day I called the eye doctor and it was okay. You know, but, so this, you know, a lot of these I have a kind of body identification with, all of these paintings. With you said the kind of the surfaces that you make using fingers and gloves and... Yeah, I, I, before this, these are all palette knife. And, you know, those over there are all finger painted. And, uh, you know, rarely use a brush. And so here's the kind of dried skin, and here's a pointy thing that's really nasty. And, you know, so I feel, I, you know, when, when I'm th making this painting, I'm feeling like what it feels like to a body. I'm trying to represent something like that, particularly one that's getting older. You know, I said that to someone who was in the gallery yesterday, and, <laughs> and, and she said, oh, yes. <laughs> you know. Right, well, you know, um, when we were talking the other day, we were discussing how those self-portraits and the custom-made superhero outfits were, were um, very much about getting older and trying to, trying, to, trying to look cool, but knowing you weren't, um, and I said, you know, but these references are a lot, a lot less direct. And you said something like, I don't want it to be a one-liner anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, in those paintings, I was, you know, hanging on to a, a gym rope that I had in my studio in some of those paintings. And something I couldn't do even in high school. And, you know, hanging on for dear life in a spandex outfit with boxing shoes hoping against hope that I would look cool. And I had lots of shoes. I have a big collection of them that I used in these paintings. All, all, all part of life. All, all part of life. And then, Including shopping. And then I, then I started, uh, <laughs> at some point, when I was, when I was, I don't remember exactly when it was. It was in the early 90s. It was, I think it was right after you had been painting these very powerful, elegant, um, shaped and, and geometric paintings. Right. And in fact, in the catalog essay, I quoted a friend when you started making paintings that said things like, um, schmaltz kills and disgusting trace, who called me up and said, um, have, I, have, I, have you seen Arthur's new paintings? They're so weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, disgusting trace. Like, why would anyone put that in the painting? Yeah, in Hollywood size letters. In Hollywood, yeah. Uh, but, you know, so I started thinking about, you know, I was a Jewish kid from Queens and I was really obsessed with Italian Catholic Baroque architecture uh, as a result of my mother having been on a trip. She was a school teacher during the Depression, which meant she had enough money to, you know, to go on a, on a cruise to Italy. So there were all these photographs and picture postcards, you know, snapshots in my parents' coffee table drawer. And I used to sneak them out and, and draw them because it seemed, first of all, I was violating her privacy. And second of all, it was just kind of weird you know, to be painting these churches. Of course, they knew it all along and, you know, thought it was funny as hell. <laughs> and uh, so then, you know, I started thinking about that and I started thinking about, you know, those kinds of humorous religious assimilation issues. So I started making paintings. It was meant to be, you know, 
bad assimilation. And well, one, of, one of the things you said to me about it, you were feeling like everything you did at the time was wrong, kind of not right. kosher, as not a, kosher, as a young not kosher. Fa as a, not young father, but as a relatively new father, I thought I was fucking up. And I didn't, I didn't know what, was, what I was supposed to do. I had no idea. You know, they don't give you a manual. Throughout, it often feels like you have a little bit of a compulsion to be, to be An outrageous asshole. or try. <laughs> okay. um, I would say this work is, is, is different. Um, and these paintings were preceded, as Arthur said, directly preceded by paintings of bulls, um, huge, of course, that were confrontational and aggressive. And um, these new paintings are very powerful, but to me, they don't feel aggressive. Um, they are not shrinking violets. They're, 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 not, they're not modest, but, um, but I would say that some of them feel very tender, and I have said they feel very open. And so this is a change that... Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, mean I, I have had so many influences that we, I haven't even begun to touch on, and one of them was Yankee Stadium. You know, I used to love to go to Yankee Stadium. And one of the reasons was that in major league ballparks, the field is supposed to be aligned due north, due south. And that's why left-handed pitchers are called southpaws. However, due to architectural kind of conceits, there is a kind of askew, an askew relationship with the foul line, say, with the seats. And it looks off, it looks off, and it looks off as it turns out, I found that later on in my life, in the same way that Barmini buildings sometimes look. So I was able to put a number of things together, but what's, what's interesting about it to me is that people ask what your influences are as an artist, and I always think that, you know, they, people want to hear what artists influence you. And it's just as likely to be a loaf of bread that influenced you aesthetically uh, as a painter as, you know, some great work of art or architecture. Uh, and I've, that's happened to me many, many times in my life. And, you know, so it, everything, is, everything is an inspiration. Everything's a potential inspiration. And at, and at this point, you know, I guess you could say that your work is, is influenced by your preceding work. Um, an artist friend said to you recently that, that you couldn't have made these paintings without having made all the preceding paintings. All the different paintings right. you've made. You know, to me, you know, since I've done at least an equal amount of representational and abstract painting during the course of my life, serious, not serious. And when you're painting representationally, it tends, you tend to be doing something different than if you're painting abstractly, because when you're painting representationally, you're supposed to make forms, you know, that have volume and, you know, they have light and they have, you know, space in the room or whatever, whatever it is. And when you're painting abstractly, you don't necessarily have to do that so that when you put them all together in one painting, you get a lot of confusion or a lot of conflict, not confusion so much as conflicts. And I love the conflicts. I welcome the conflicts in a painting that makes it seem like that's me. You know, that's my, that's my language, the language of conflict. You could see that in many of these paintings. You know, I, I feel like in these paintings also, you have you have the vocabulary and the and the spirit of previous paintings, but also, I feel like these in these you've kind of let go in a way um, that I wouldn't that I wouldn't characterize your previous work. I mean, um, each one has to figure itself out on its own terms. Um, yeah, it, these I I just sort of let it go you know, like trying to escape. You know, the post-pandemic too. You know, like you want to escape. You know, some of them were like those two on the end, which I really like, but they were made at the height of, you know, of the worst part of the pandemic. 
now I, you know, I want to just like feel like I'm flying off. Mm. And, uh, you know, and then also you're caged in, you know, you know, with your family, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, during Not the pandemic good. and then, you know, it's both intimate and, you know, you get angry and, you know, everyone gets angry and, and so there's, there's all that and then there's, you know, the kind of sense of release. And there's another thing that had a big influence on me, which is in my first, in my first week of, of art school, of, you know, being a drawing, an art student, uh, it was drawing one. And there we were, we were drawing this nude model and she was sitting on, uh, she was sitting on one of those big model stands. And then she took a break and I was drawing it as dutifully as I could. And then she went on a break and I was just started doodling this self-portrait on one side, the other side of the piece of paper, but as big as the model. And, and I, I looked at it and I said, wow, that looks pretty cool, you know, having both of those things together. And then I saw the Jackson Pollock painting, Portrait and Dream, and that was fantastic. It and, was that, like, and that's a painting with, in a sense, like an, an image on one side in the middle of a bunch of abstraction. Yeah, well, to, to the, on the general. left side is the, re, is the regular Pollock stuff, and on the right side is, is a self-portrait by Pollock. You know, it's kind of, at, you know, in his style, but it's completely different because it's a self-portrait. And it's like someone wearing two different badges at the same time different branches of, ser of the service or different alliances. And that has affected me throughout my life as, as a painter. And I can even look at these paintings and, and find things like that that not only go within one painting, but go from painting to painting. Because when I look at my paintings, you know, they all, I see them all in a room. And, you know, and, and you know, the, the connections from one thing to another are, you know, from one painting to another, you know, are very inspirational to me. You know, they, they're very instructive also. One thing about these paintings that seems to me different or at a different level from your, from your preceding work is color, which has always been important in, mo in most of your work, but now it really has an urgency. When we were talking about these paintings prior to the show, you you know you would refer to the one with the, with the Naples yellow, or the the one with the with the three blues, or the one the one with the little pink thing. And once when you actually did title the paintings, even the titles were kind of along the same lines. You know, some of them have titles like Hatchet, but you have Memories of Cobalt Green Deep, the very direct and descriptive painting called. Sap green, gray, and ultramarine yellow. <laughs> um, ultramarine yellow, by the way, is a color. That's I'm a know. paint junkie. Right. Exa and oh, that's exactly many, what you many, are. Many years ago, there was an art supply store in Soho, a first in the 23rd Street, David Davis. I don't know if, and if you remember, some of you remember him. And he was a kind of cantankerous guy, but I always hit it off with him. And he had this brand of paint that he had some of called Lucien Lefebvre Fanier. It was made in Paris. And it was the paint that Matisse used and Bonnard used and Mondrian apparently used it. As a matter of fact, in, in the Joan Mitchell show from a few months ago, they had right. a, a vitrine with, with, a, with a, an, a handwritten invoice with this beautiful script for a couple of thousand dollars for, for Joan Mitchell's paint. And she used some of the same colors that I used. I, it, you know, I couldn't get over that. So but the way me. you talk about color in these paintings, to me, it has, has been different from the way it, you talked about it in, in other work. It really does seem to be like the, the very core of this work. It is, it, it is, it is. I, 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 you know, just went for it. Like maybe that comes from letting the other things go. It's like. Yeah. That's what you have left. Um, yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to let everything go. And have everything. And, and have everything, right. yeah. Of course. 
Yeah, um, typical spoiled kid. Yeah. <laughs> well, you brought up, in a recent conversation, you brought up the idea of generous painting, like wanting to make generous painting. What I was referring to is that when I'm making a painting, I have so many different impulses and, you know, that you're not, things you're not supposed to put together. And I made a vow at some point I was never going to legislate anything out of a painting that I was making, whether it was for me or whoever was going to look at it. In connection to that, you told me a story, a really vivid story about making a, a drawing on the floor when you were a child. So yeah, you I could tell that story. Yeah, I used to. Go, my parents used to take me to the Met and the Frick when I was a kid, and not realizing it would I would become an artist, <laughs> and uh, and then being a little horrified. What did we do? And uh, so I we used, I used to go to the the Met and the Frick, and uh, I would see like some big painting, and I would. I would come home and I would tape like 10 pieces of typing paper together with scotch tape. I thought, and you, I I thought you said like 100 pieces of typing well, paper. Well, no, that was subsequent. <laughs> and then the, the, first, the first times I just tried to, you know, like do the water in a big seascape I had seen. And then, and then, at, and then the next step was to take around 40, I don't know, a lot of sheets of typing paper and, you know, use up all the scotch tape and, and put it out on the floor and try and make a drawing of something I'd never seen. That was, that was what I wanted to do.